This is Gregory Chin, CG Senior Fellow. We're here in Rome for pre-G8 meetings. We're happy to have the opportunity to interview today Dr. Diri Sek, Director of the Center for Research on Political Economy in Dakar, Senegal. We've had a chance to hear that the G8 here in Italy will be focusing on international development, especially with Africa. In your view, how has the G8 performed in terms of meeting its aid commitments from Glen Eagles till now? I think the general consensus is that uh, uh, since Glen Eagles, the, the strong commitments that were made then uh, and also followed up by uh, the Commission on Africa that was actually uh, instigated by uh, Prime Minister Blair. I mean, all that had raised a lot of hope in terms of uh, the major donors uh, galvanizing the, the agenda for development by giving a lot of uh, resources. Uh, but it seems to me that, at least uh, from the recipient's end, uh, they don't feel that commitment has been met. And uh, they're still hoping, and in fact, uh, some of the uh, uh, African heads of state, when they, when they make some resolutions, well, they make statements or actually pass resolutions at summit, they keep reminding the international community of the commitments made since Glen Eagles, and are still unmet. The Italian G8 presidency now has now said that it will present new accountability measures for the G8. Does this represent a major innovation in global governance? Should it bring hope to the global south? I think there are two things here, the intention and the reality. The intention, of course, is uh, some form of compliance. That is when uh, people make commitments that they follow through with the acts that they had promised to, to do. Um, and I think it's a very noble um, declaration. However, we have to bear in mind that uh, the G8, or for G20 for that matter, they don't have any enforceability, any enforcement capacity. Therefore, um, even if we make strong statements on the need to comply, I think uh, national governments will continue to act uh, in, the best, in the best interest. Uh, those who actually do believe in uh, supporting the development effort of developing regions will continue to do so. Those who actually comply uh, to a lesser extent will also continue to do so. But the, the, the other aspect, of course, is the, the, uh, the common action. I think if you can find a way to uh, a positive way, not just naming and shaming, but a positive way of uh, encouraging people to collectively act, perhaps in the spirit of the Paris Declaration, uh, to get them to act on behalf of development through aid. Uh, not only, you know, all the issues that were raised in the Paris Declaration, the amount of aid, composition, accountability, harmonization, and all that, I think it would be actually uh, uh, a great step forward. And let's hope that in fact uh, the Italians pushing that forward might actually uh, prompt everybody into uh, action now. Maybe a good first step. Yeah, <laughs> a good first step. <laughs> At the G8 insiders meetings, there's been a lot of talk of more emphasis on Africa, attention on international development, but very little talk on the emerging donors. What is your view of the new role of the emerging donors? And do you think the G8 can be successful in breathing new life into development yeah. if they don't engage the emerging donors seriously? Yeah. I think uh, the DAC, uh, the development assistant committee, has it, what it, like any organization, it has its history, and its way of doing things, in uh, supporting practice, and uh, even it's the, the consultation system that they have organized uh, uh, among the, uh, the historic donors. But we also know that uh, over the last few years, things have changed radically. Uh, some donors actually have literally uh, lost interest in um, keeping their effort at a higher level to support our, our developing countries, while new donors, actually emerging countries, have uh, decided to step up their effort to support uh, the development agenda. And they're doing so in a very visible manner, and uh, of course, it seems to be quite appreciated by the recipients because that, of course, increases the level of resources that they receive. But not just that, there's also the spirit in which aid is given. Because there's also so often talk of um, the, the lesser conditionality or the absence of conditionality 
that comes with a coming from uh, emerging countries like China or India and to a less extent Brazil and because those countries actually can say, well usually say that they can put themselves very easily in the shoes of the recipient countries therefore there's some form of uh, uh, mutual understanding that is emerging and hopefully it will also reverberate into the dark countries that would probably rethink the way it is given but also beyond that international organization uh, institutions such as World Bank and uh, the IMF to, to rethink the spirit in which uh, it is given. Now, the question was if they're not, if they ignored, will the development agenda uh, be helped? Obviously not. I think that there's no reason to uh, keep things the same, uh, especially given the, fact that the volume of aid and the long term commitment to aid that these emerging countries are actually uh, promising and announcing. Therefore, we should rethink the aid package uh, in, in such a way that uh, harmonization and coordination among donors will also include those new, uh, emerging uh, countries.